in our last session, we were talking about uh, the results of sin and how God has a plan for that. And uh, we were covering uh, the different people that God goes through to get those things done from Adam to Noah, Noah now to Abraham. Um, and uh, we're going to continue in our study in Genesis. But today, and you should write this down, we're going to take a look at uh, protecting God's plan for your life. And you got to protect it from something. And this is the part that I want you to really key on, key in on today is protecting God's plan for your life from faithlessness, fear, and confusion. Protecting God's plan for your life from faithlessness, fear, and confusion. And then we'll look at the result of not staying in fellowship with God, as God is calling you to purpose and calling you up higher. Um, he has more for you to do, and he needs you to stay focused and stay close to him. And then the consequence of doing your will and not God's will. The consequence of you doing your will and not God's will, which is always dangerous. Uh, when God calls you to purpose and on the path to purpose, he gives you instructions, as we have seen in our study, um, here on the Arise Bible Study and Fellowship, God always gives instructions. Uh, and if we add to the instructions, it can be quite devastating to our path to purpose. So we're also, uh, by way of recap, we always do a recap. So by way of recap, this is what we looked at. Um, God calls Abram to leave his people in Genesis 12. Abram takes his wife, uh, his wife, his servants, and chooses also to take his nephew Lot with him, which God didn't tell him to do. He decided to add that. Uh, Abram and Lot separate, and Lot chooses to go to the well-watered valley near Sodom in Genesis 13. Some of you guys might be familiar with Sodom. Sodom and Gomorrah. He decided to pitch his uh, tent right beside that city. Uh, then Abram uh, has to rescue Lot in Genesis 14, and and so we, we actually didn't go in depth into those things, um, but we're going to come back to that uh, later on. Uh, as a result, we're going to see the result of Lot's decision to do what he did and what Abraham has to do because of that. Uh, and then God makes a covenant or a binding agreement with Abram in Genesis 15. And that's important to note because this is God restoring man back to himself. And so there's going to be a series of God speaking to men on the earth, men and women actually on the earth to establish his covenant. Uh, in the earth, and it's going to be the restoration process that we're going to look at uh, with this Bible study we're doing right now. We've been doing this now, I think going on five weeks now. Um, we've been doing this ever since uh, January 31st, so however many weeks that is. Um, so, uh, but let's pick up where we left off in Genesis chapter 16, where God promises to bless Abram's wife, Sarai, uh, who is barren with a son, and what happens when they grow impatient and get ahead of God's plan for their life. And you may of being in the same situation where you want God to do something so quick, you decide, I'm going to add to it. God didn't tell me to do it, but I'm ready for things to happen. And you get out there just doing stuff. And there's a there's a consequence for that. And we're going to take a look at what the consequence is in, uh, in their life. So right now we're picking up where God promises Abram a son of his own from his wife, Sarah, who is barren, by the way, who can't have children. And what happens as a result of them growing impatient? Uh, so we're in Genesis chapter 16. Um, and it starts off now, Sarah, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. She had a female Egyptian servant who was named Hagar. And Sarah said to Abram, behold, now the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Go into my servant. It may be that I shall obtain children by her. And Abram listened to the voice of Sarah. So after Abram had lived 10 years in the land of Canaan, Sarah, Abram's wife, took Hagar, the Egyptian, her servant, and gave her to Abram, her husband, as a wife. Okay, so let's back up. As we always do, we like to take our time going through scripture. You just don't read over it uh, here on the Arise Bible Study. Uh, so let me, we're going to go back. Verse 2, and Sarah said to Abram, behold, now the Lord has prevented. Look at this. The Lord has prevented me from bearing children. You know what she's saying? God's not keeping his promise. I don't know what he's doing. He's taking too much time here. He has not did what he said. And look what she does from that point of impatience and doubting God, by the way. That's her doubting God. If you if you think about times in your life where God gave you a promise and, and what did you do as a result of that? Because you may have doubted. It opens up the door for sin to occur. And let's look what happens. She says, go into my servant, which she's basically saying, you know, have intercourse with my servant. 
it, now look, it may be that I shall obtain children by her. It may be. Not like I didn't even check in with God on this, but maybe this is the way God wants things to happen, right? And certainly Abram, having his own relationship with God, will be able to say, look, God gave us a promise. I'm going to take a stand on this. Nope, we're going to wait for God. Let's see what Abram does. And Abram listened to the voice of Sarah. He was like, oh, you want me to have sex with your servant? Okay. Like not even a moment of questioning whether God is saying this. Not even a, 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 a inkling of hesitation to, is this what God promised? So after Abram had lived 10 years in the land of Canaan, Sarah, Abram's wife took Hagar, the Egyptian, by the way, what do we know about God's promised people and the Egyptians? That's not a good mix. Her servant and gave her to Abram, her husband, as a wife. Now, according to um, their laws at the time, the wife had the right, a, a barren wife, had the right to have her servant be a surrogate in a sense surrogate in a sense to have children and the children born to the servant became the wife's child so this is not like outside of their you know their rules she's operating within their rules but she's she's operating ahead of god all right so um i don't know if you guys have any questions or anything you guys want to say but please feel free to unmute your mics and share if you have anything uh, any questions or or anything you'd like to share at this point? I always like to keep it open, not not just a straight Bible study. So we're good. Okay, so we'll keep going. All right. So we see here we know that God's given Abram a promise. He's given him his word, and they're supposed to wait and have patience. They're now getting ahead of that, and the one who gets ahead of it is Sarah. Now I want to tell you guys something. There's a similarity here between Sarah and Abram that matches. Adam and Eve. Look at what happens when the wife gets ahead of the plan for the husband. This is this is there's a reason why God has this as the first few books in of the Bible of the entire Bible, sixty six books. There's a reason why Genesis chapter one through sixteen has these things popping up time and time again because there's an order to God's plan, and if the wife jumps ahead of God's plan for her husband. Oftentimes, it causes destruction. And we saw where Adam listened to Eve. And we see here where Abram listens to Sarah instead of listening to God. It happens again. And sin, one thing about sin is sin is re re repetitive. And it gets progressively worse, actually. So so we, I want you guys always to look at similarities of occurrences. Because we are suffering from the same sickness. The sickness is called sin. And it has the same symptoms. Prideful, arrogance impatience, fear, and it causes us to operate outside of God's will. And we see it happen here again. All right. So now we're going to see what happens next. So uh, what happens when the thing you did outside of God's will matures to full term and gives birth? What is the result of your disobedience? Let's take a look at what was the result of their disobedience. And in verse 14 and verse four. Now, of course, we're in Genesis chapter 16. All right. Verse four. And he went into Hagar, so he had in course with Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, what happened? She looked with contempt on her mistress. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. What happens when the thing that you make happen turns and attacks you? What happens when you try to be God in your own life and decide, well, I'm going to do this? And the thing that you did that you thought was going to set you free actually turns on you and attacks you. What happens when you get outside of the will of God and think you know better than him? And then the thing you did causes you even more pain. It was bad enough that she was barren. Now the woman she's allowed to have sex with her husband is now going to have the baby that she can't have. And that woman is now looking at her with contempt. Mm. And Sarah said, verse five, and Sarah said to Abram, may the wrong done to me be on you. Look what happens. Look what happens. Look what happens. I always think this is just funny to me. I mean, this is because I'm married. I've been married for uh, 30 years now, going on 31 years. Look what happens. The thing that Sarah asked Abram to do, the thing that Abram did because his wife said that he should, once it happens and she gets this negative result, the very next thing we see her do is attack her husband. And Sarah said to Abram, may the wrong done to me be on you. Like it was his fault. 
I gave my servant, look, listen to this thing. I gave my servant to your embrace. And when she saw that she had conceived, she looked on me with contempt. May the Lord judge between you and me. Look how she going in on Abram. She's going hostile on her husband because of this thing didn't work out the way she planned. We got to be careful. We don't attack the people that are suffering because of our decision, like it's their fault. She ain't accepting no blame. You see this? She's accepting no blame. Verse six. But Abram said to Sarah, behold, your servant is in your power. Do to her as you please. Whew, I would have said some quite, my, my words would have been different. That's why I'm not, I wasn't Abram. Then Sarah dealt her harshly with her and she fled from her. Okay, now, 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 I'm going to tell y'all. This right here, then Sarah dealt harshly with her. Uh, that wasn't verbally. That was physically. I'm absolutely sure she beat that woman, which was her right, because that was her I servant. Yeah. Say again? I said, I agree. This is awful. Yeah, yeah. She beat that woman. And look, this lady was a servant. She didn't ask to be a servant. She got out, she, she got purchased. She didn't ask to be with Abram and Sarah, but she did. She, she's her she's a servant. She's serving her. And then this lady has the audacity to come to her one day and say, look, I'm going to need you to have sex with my husband because I can't have children. And she couldn't say no. Why? They would have killed her. She can't say no. She had to lay there and let that man do that. And after doing it, this is what's happening. Now, truly, she, you know, she did look on content with her mistress. But part of that is, you know, I'm a servant. I have my own will. Now, you don't force me to have sex with your husband. And now I'm pregnant with his child. Like, and you're going to take this child from me. That's partly, partly why that contempt came up. It's, it's sad. Then Sarah dealt harshly with her and she ran away. She fled from her. Now look what God does. Oh my gosh. I, I, there's so much I wish I could tell you guys, but we don't got enough time. Verse seven, the angel of the Lord. Look how God steps in. Mm. You tell me God don't see you. You tell me God doesn't see you in your pain. This is an Egyptian woman being treated wrongly by one of God's children. Man. Then the angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness, the spring on the way to shore. And he said, Hagar, servant of Sarah. Man, look, this is one of the first times that God is speaking to someone outside of the covenant about the covenant. Man, I got more. Y'all going to see in a second. This thing is going to blossom open. It's going to be beautiful. And he said, Hagar, servant of Sarah, where have you come from and where are you going? Now, you know, goodness, well, the Lord knows this. Remember, we talk about how God deals with us. He needs us to understand where we are. And that's what this question is about. Hagar, and I say that because for those of you who are watching for the first time, God is omniscient, all right? And which means he's all knowing. And when it says, I gotta go back so we can see it, uh, and the angel of the capital L-O-R-D, and we know whenever there's a capital L-O-R-D, we're talking about Jehovah, our God, all right? So verse eight, and he said, Hagar, servant of Sarah, where have you come from and where are you going? She said, I am fleeing from my mistress, Sarah. Now, look, we're going to stop because this is that stuff. So I'm talking. About. We can't just breeze over scripture because you're going to miss it. The angel of the Lord spoke and this Egyptian woman heard him speaking and answered. That's powerful. God is always interacting with his children. We just got to we got to listen. Verse nine, the angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit. Look at this instructions in the midst of her pain now we've been studying the purpose of suffering and trials and tribulation and it says that the purpose of suffering is and i could ask you guys but you know i'm going to tell you it's the bible says the purpose of suffering is to learn obedience she's suffering and look what god is saying be obedient i know this is hurt i know it hurts it don't even make sense but i'm gonna need you to go back i'm gonna need you to return to your mistress and submit to her now, you know, Sarah is Sarah is back in the camp. Then beat this woman probably. And Lord, forgive me if she didn't, but I just got it since I feel that it's possible that she could have beat her. So well, let's just say the, the Bible says treated her harshly. OK, we're going to stick with the Bible. And 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 now she's got to go back to man. She got to go back to that woman because the Lord says so. Right. Now this is the important thing, because the Lord says so. Return to your mistress and submit to her. Then verse 10, the angel of the Lord, you know, I'm going to stop right here. You know, it's so funny when I'm teaching, as I'm talking to you guys and I'm sharing with you all, I'm teaching and I'm talking, but I'm thinking and I'm having a whole conversation in my head at the same time. It's, it's hilarious to me. All right, we're going we're gonna to keep going. 
All right, because uh, you might see me smile while I'm talking. It's because I'm talking to myself at the same time. All right, so verse uh, 8, and Hagar, servant of Sarah. All right, verse 8. And he said, Hagar, servant of Sarah, where have you come from and where are you going? She said, I'm fleeing from my mistress Sarah, the angel Sarah, and the angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit a word that, I'm going to tell y'all, a word that women hate. Man, this word that the man, the word, this word of women hate on the planet. Because it sounds like you're putting yourself under unnecessary burden and suffering. But there's power in submission. You should write that down. Good God Almighty. There is power in submission. Because if God's called you to it, it's for a reason. He said to return to your mistress. Not only return, because there's two things. Return and submit, which means do what she says. Allow yourself by an act of your will to do what is right before my eyes. Return and submit. God may have called us to return and submit to people in places that we don't want to be. But if God's called you to it, God will bring you through it. All right, let's look at verse 10. Then the angel of the Lord also said to her, I will surely, look at the promise. First comes the instruction, then comes the promise. Goodness, look at the pattern. The angel of the Lord also said to her, I will surely multiply your offspring so that they cannot be numbered for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said to her, look at how big this thing gets. Behold, you are pregnant and shall bear a son. You shall call his name Ishmael. Man, I don't I don't know. Some something, something special happening, y'all. I, I let me just keep on going. Oh my God. Behold, you are pregnant and you shall bear a son. You shall call his name Ishmael. This is prophecy. He's he's telling this woman that just got treated harshly, who ran away to go back, and I'm going to tell you what's going to happen. This is what he's saying. Look, I'm going to give you some peace. I'm going to give you hope because you're going to have a son. And look, not only are you going to have a son, but you shall call his name Ishmael. And there's a little C right here. And that's for this cliff note that's down here. Oh, the cliff note is on another page. I'll find it. And you shall call his name Ishmael because the Lord has listened to your affliction. The Lord has listened to your affliction. God hears you. God hears your prayers. God knows your pain. God hears you. This is the pattern. We are studying here on the Rise Bible Study Fellowship, not the Bible. We're not studying the Bible. We're studying God. This is theology, theos, the study of God. We are studying his word to know who he is. And if you know who he is, you can know how he operates. You can know his will for his children. And we see it right here. The Lord has listened. He's been listening. The Lord has listened to your affliction. He shall be a what? Now, now he's talking about the son now. She's going, he's saying, now look, you're going to have a son. You can call him Ishmael, but let me tell you who he's going to be. He shall be a wild donkey of a man. His hand against everyone and everyone's hand against him. And he shall dwell over against all his kinsmen. Does that sound good to you? Not necessarily. But he did say that, you know, that he's going to, let's go back. The angel of the Lord, verse 10, the Lord also said to her, I will surely multiply your offspring so that they cannot be numbered for multitude. Where have we heard that before? Where have we heard that promise? How can how can the angel of the Lord tell the Egyptian woman that, that this is going to happen for her? Who is that? This was said to somebody earlier. Who's that said to? It was said to Abram. That promise was given to Abram. And now... Uh, Hagar is now getting the same promise from the angel of the Lord. Why? Why is that the case? Has God now switched from Abram to Hagar? No. It is because the seed inside her is the seed of promise. It came from Abram. So that seed is now giving her favor. And because of that favor, God has visited her and is now telling her what's going to happen. Because Abram and Sarah jumped ahead of God and did this, that seed is now in Hagar. And there's going to be a consequence for this, but we're going to see. All right. He shall be a wild donkey of a man, verse 12, his hand against everyone, look, fighting against everybody, and everybody's hand against him, and he shall dwell over against his kins kinsmen. Verse 13, so he called the name of the Lord, so she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her, you are a God of seeing, for she said, truly here I have seen him who looks after me. Then this is the name she called him. Therefore, the well was called Ber Laharoi. It lies between Kadesh and Bered. And, and so Ber Laharoi actually means uh, you are a God of seeing. That's what that's that's how that breaks out. 
All right. And Hagar bore Abraham a son. Look, she went back to her honor, to her to her uh, righteousness. She went back and Hagar bore Abraham's son, just like the angel of the Lord said. And Abram called the name of his son, whom Hagar bore Ishmael. Look what happened. That angel did not speak to, to uh, Abram. That angel spoke to Hagar. You know what happened? When Hagar came back, she had a little come to Jesus meeting with Abram. When I was in the wilderness, after I was treated harshly by Sarah, you know what happened? The angel of the Lord came to me. You know what he said? And she told him, and I'm going to have a son, and his name is going to be Ishmael. See, the woman doesn't name the child. It's the man that names the child. But in this case, that woman had power while that seed was inside her. Now she has authority, and Abram submitted to that. His name is going to be Ishmael. If you say that, his name is Ishmael. That's powerful. Verse 16, Abraham was 86 years old when Hagar bore Ishmael to Abraham. Did I say 86? Yes, I did. Do y'all know any 86-year-olds having children? No, you don't. But right here, God has a promise, and he's doing it when it's past the time of childbearing to show it's him, because only he could do that. And we're going to see this happen again, and that's going to be in Genesis chapter 17. We're going to continue. Abraham and the covenant of circumcision. Now, we know about circumcision. I think I brought this out when we talked about Moses. If I didn't, I'm going to tell you right now. When Moses was on Mount Sinai, Right when Moses was on Mount Sinai talking with God, and this is the first time. This is not with the children of Israel, not with, not with the Hebrews. I'm sorry, not with the Hebrews. This is Moses the first time um, um, when he went up to the, the mountain and he talked with God. When God called him up, um, God gave him instructions on what to do, uh, and one of the instructions God told him to do was to circumcise his son, um, and and that's cutting the foreskin of the of the child's um, body part. And um, and uh, Moses didn't do it. I don't know why. Maybe Moses was thinking, I'm not going to hurt my baby. But this is the first time this is being done. It's a part of the covenant. And Moses didn't do it. I don't know if he forgot or whatever. And God, it says, the Bible says that God sought Moses on the way when he was coming down the mountain. But he sought him to kill him. And Moses' wife saved his life because Moses' wife grabbed a stone, by the way, sharp stone, and circumcised her baby and threw the threw the um the foreskin of that onto Moses' feet and saved his life and God stopped kill, from killing Moses. That's in the Bible. Just want to tell y'all. And so we see this Abraham and the covenant of circumcision. This is moving forward now from that that time period to this period because this is what God intends to happen. God intends to establish his covenant in the earth by this way. So verse 17, I mean uh we do chapter 17. Uh when Abram was 90 years old the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless, that I may make my covenant between me and you and may multiply you greatly. Then Abraham fell on his face and God said to him, Behold, my covenant is with you and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram. So he's changing his name, but your name shall be Abraham. I'm stop right here. Do you know that the name that you currently have is not your name? That's the name your parents gave you. That's not the name God gave you. God is actually going to give you a new name. That's in the revelations. You're going to have a whole new name given to you um, when we get on the other side, the life that is to come. Just a little side note there. All right. Just to show you that God's about changing names because he, when you get a name change, your purpose changes. Then Abraham fell on his face, right? Verse three, verse four. Behold, my covenant is with you and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you a father of a multitude, right? And that's the promise. I've made you a father of a multitude of nations. I I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make you into nations, and kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring. See, that's that's what happened to Hagar, and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. And I will give to you and to your offspring after you the land of your soul journeys, where you're traveling, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession. And I will be their God. Wow. So Abraham's 99 years old. And he's hearing this. Verse 9. And God said to Abraham, his name is now changed. As for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your offspring after you throughout their generations. This is my covenant which you shall keep between me and you and your offspring after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised. That's the first thing he tells them. They shall be circumcised. You shall be circumcised in your flesh. 
the flesh of your foreskin and shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. He said, yeah, I know you're 99, but guess what? You're about to do the same thing. Verse 12, he who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised. Every baby that's born that's a male on the eighth day circumcision. Every male throughout your generations, whether born in your house or bought with your money from any foreigner who is not of your offspring, both he who is born in your house and he who is bought with your money shall surely be circumcised. So shall my covenant be in your flesh an everlasting covenant. Mm. Now, I'm going to tell you guys, you know, every nation doesn't do this. America does this, circumcises every male child. But there's a lot of nations around the world that don't. They don't circumcise their male children. And so that's another sign of knowing who's in covenant with God and who's not, who's coming from that descendancy, right? Who's, who's coming from this promise. Verse 14, any uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. This was a promise. This was given to Abraham. Abraham. So like now this doesn't apply to us now. Uh, it doesn't mean if a man is not circumcised, somehow he's outside of God's will. It just, it's just in this time period, that's what it says. Uh, Isaac's birth promise. All right, verse 15. And God said to Abraham, as for Sarah, your wife, that one that told you to get ahead of my plan. No, he's not going to treat her bad. As for Sarah, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarah, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her. Look, God blesses us even in our mess. Mm. I will bless her, and moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall become nations, and she shall become nations. Kings of people shall come from her. Then Abraham, Abraham fell on his face and laughed. He laughed at God, y'all, and laughed and said to himself, Shall a child be born to a man who is 100 years old? Shall Sarah, who is 90 years old, be, be um, bear a child? And Abraham said to God, oh, that Ishmael might live before you. Man, let me, man, mm, boy. If y'all knew the implications of what he just said, God is, God is, man, God is talking to Abraham saying, look, I'm going to fulfill my promise. Even in your age, I'm going to bless you. Matter of fact, I'm going to bless your wife. I'm going to change her name. Sarah, mother of many nations. I'm, I'm, I'm going to bless them. And then he goes, oh, you know that mistake that we made? You know, the one that's been living before me out of your will, this 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 young man over here. Can can you can you do it through him? Can you bless him? Even in the midst of the promise being spoken by God, this man is looking at their sin and their disobedience and saying, I know we were disobedient, but still bless him. It's gonna be See, a yeah. You know, I think it goes even further. It goes to the point that God had made him a promise so many years ago and it had not been fulfilled. And so with that comes doubt. Sure. You know, I'm making all this up. This is in my head. This isn't God. So he was so to the point of not believing God that he's probably laughing going, oh, I don't believe you, but okay. Well, why don't we just do it through the one I got right here? Mm. You know? So when you yeah. talk that our lesson is about unfaithfulness, you know, and faithlessness. Yeah. It kind of to that. That's good. Nope, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. He's like, and plus, he's like, I'm 100 years old. My wife is 90. You know how much work that's going to be? And she going to have a baby too? Oh my gosh. Like, can you just use the one we got? Good point. Very good point. But this again is a problem with us speaking, saying the wrong things in the midst of the promise being fulfilled. Verse 18, the Abram said to God, be careful what you say to God. Just, just be careful. Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. God said, no. Look at this. This is one of the first times you see God say no. Man. Uh, but Sarah, your wife, shall bear you a son. He's like, I'm I'm talking to you, Abraham. Don't, don't, why are you bringing up him? You, you need to listen to what I just said to you. No, listen to what I just said. But Sarah, your wife, shall bear you a son, and you shall call his name Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his uh, for his offspring after him. Now, look, look, I'm telling y'all, God is loving, God is patient, and God has his own plan. And God is saying, no, my plan is going to be done, Abraham. My plan. Stop trying to derail what, stop trying to think, lean to your own understanding, think what I need to do for you. I know what I need to do for you. Let me do that. But now look what happens, because he opened his big mouth, just like Sarah did when she said, have sex with my servant. Look what, now I'm going to tell y'all what happens. 
I will say my covenant. Now look, verse 19, God said, no, but, but Sarah, your wife shall bear you a son and you shall call his name Isaac. I will establish my covenant, my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his offspring after him. Look at verse 20. As for Ishmael, I have heard you and you did this. It's your will. Behold, I have blessed him and I will make him fruitful and multiply him greatly. He shall father 12 princes and I will make him into a great nation. But I will establish my covenant with Isaac, whom Sarah shall bear to you at this time next year. Now, let's go back up here. Let's go back just for a second. Let's go back to when God spoke to Hagar and told her about her son. Now, guys, now establish, bless Ishmael and said, now I'm going to make him a great nation and 12 kings will come from him and they'll have their own people because you said this. And what kind of people are they going to be? They're going to be the same kind of people the man is like. Behold, you are pregnant and shall bear a son. You shall call his name Ishmael because the Lord has listened to your affliction. He shall be a wild donkey of a man and they shall be a wild donkey of a people. His hand will be against everyone. Their hand shall be against everyone and everyone's hand against them. Everyone will want to fight them and be at war against them. And he shall dwell over against his own kinsmen. He especially will fight against his brethren. Now, I don't know why I'm so, you know, animated this morning about this, but it bothers me. This is that, that, this is that stuff that's happening. This is the stuff that happened in the garden, people. Us jumping in the way of God's will. Can't we just be still and know that God is God and don't move until he tells us, no matter how it looks? This I'm dealing with this in my own life. Man, I got all kinds of things popping off. But you know what? I'm like, I ain't moving, God, until you bless me, until you tell me to say or do. I'm not. I'm tired of trying to make this stuff up and figure it out on my own because it never works out. I want your will to be done. And if I got to be still in the midst of the lion's den and stand here and look at these lines until you take me up out of here, I'm going to do that because I'm tired of wasting time and causing more pain in my own life and in my own future because of my disobedience to God. I don't want that to happen no more. And let me show y'all what's, what's going to happen because he did that. Abraham already knew he had a promise and that from his loins will come kings and great nations. And now they have made this mistake with Ishmael and he's saying, look, well, bless him too. And now this donkey of a man is going to have a donkey of a people who are going to be at war. Who are those people? Let's take a look. Who, who are we talking about? Because now he has two sons. He has Ishmael and he has Isaac. Ishmael is the donkey of the man. Isaac is the son of promise. But who descended from them? What were these two great nations that came out of these two men because of the covenant that God made with Abraham? Well, let's take a look at that. Here we go. Just so you can take a glimpse of this. Look at this, people. Abraham had Isaac. From Isaac came Judaism and Christianity. Abraham also had an Ishmael. From Ishmael, oh, look, comes Islam, the Muslims that are still fighting against not only their brethren, who is Isaac and Judaism, but against everybody on the planet. God's word is true. And because Abraham stepped out with the Egyptian and listened to his wife, this nation was born. And to this day, since that time, 2,700 years ago to this time, probably more than 2,700 years ago to this time, that donkey of a man and donkey of a nation is still fighting against people and people are fighting against them. It's just, it's just, oh, praise the Lord. But God, God has a plan. And that's the one thing we do know here on the Rise Bible Study and Fellowship that, you know, I, what I was just thinking, you, you know, I, tell, I told you guys I have this conversation in my head. What I was just thinking is that if they had kept to the promise, all the con conflict we've ever had with the Muslim nation, the nations of, um, with Islam and with Muslim nations would never, never have happened on the planet. All those conflicts, all those people dying never would have died. It would have only been Ishmael and his line and to move forward according to God's will. And it's the same thought about the garden. If Eve and Adam had never eaten the fruit, we would never have sinned. And what would be the world be like? That's the kind of thing that's always on my heart is thinking about the consequences of our disobedience when God is trying to move us forward to purpose. And the reason why it's there is because it's, that's how I see my own life. I do not want to say or do something that's going to cause uh a ripple effect in time as it moves forward that not only impacts me and my family, but people around me because of my disobedience, my getting ahead of God. Because the worst thing you could do is say you're doing something for God and it's not for God. And then you end up hurting people and damaging their relationship with God and maybe even causing them to fight, which is definitely not God's will. God's the God of love. Matter of fact, God is not the God of love. The Bible says God is love. Right. And so 
as his children, we got to be really careful that we are operating according to his will and that we are allowing God to use us in the way that he wants us to be used so that he can do his will in our life. This is the whole thing when we pray that your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, right? When we pray that prayer, what we don't realize is we're saying, God, I have a will, but I'm praying your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And that's something we say, but we actually do is our own will. Think about that. You're praying, you're praying God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven, but there's times when you don't even check in with God before you make a decision. You just do what you feel like. Man, maybe this will be what God will bless. And you create your own stuff. God bless this. I, I'm doing this, bless this. And God's like, you didn't even ask me. You didn't even come to me and ask me. And because you asked me to bless the thing that you created, it's going to cost you. And that's, I've seen that time and time again with myself, man. I, oh, man. I, I, I launched a, I launched a, um, I was waiting to launch a gospel station in the Richmond market uh, called Rejoice Radio. We were waiting to launch it. And the guys who owned it, uh, they were Jewish. They also owned the station in Norfolk. And um, and I was waiting. I was getting bored. And I was like, man, I they didn't hire me to sit here and, and not do not launch this gospel station in Richmond. And, and I noticed they had the station in Norfolk. And so we drove down to Norfolk and they showed it to me. It was beautiful. It was laid. It had no employees. It was just sitting dormant. And I got this great idea. I said, well, while we're waiting, why don't we launch this station? in Norfolk while we're waiting for the FCC approval on the station in Richmond. And they was like, well, that's a great idea. Here I go. Well, you know what? We can use the Rejoice musical soul food format and we can catch it by satellite down here. And so they put me up in a four-star hotel, five-star hotel. And I'm eating just awesome meals every day. And I'm trying to launch the station. It was the worst time of my life. I was in literal hell down there. I mean, it was not God's will. Time and time again, things happen. Even the person, even the business beside our location who I become, associates with got arrested because of stuff they did wrong and here i was thinking i'm establishing business relationships to build this station and it all went sideways i found myself and i'm like, i don't mind telling y'all i found myself on the floor of that radio station in tears asking god to deliver me from the thing that i would i was asking him to bless and the, and i'm sharing that with you because we we as children of god uh children of light we have to be very careful that we don't think we're God and we can just create a thing and God is supposed to bless it. God will allow it because he's not, you know, we have our own will. He'll allow us to build a prison for ourselves, and he'll be there waiting for us when we're ready to be delivered out of it. But we want to caution you today on the Rise Bible Study and Fellowship because we love your Rise family. Just stop. Stop. Have a whole season, a week, a month, months of just like, God, I'm not moving forward on anything until you tell me what it is you want me to do. Will you bless this thing? And if he says, no, stop this, stop, leave that person, leave that group, leave that church, leave this business, shut it down. Don't do it. Whatever God tells you to do, do that and watch how blessed your life is. And when I say bless your life is, I'm not just saying that you're always going to have good. I'm just saying no matter what happens, good will come out of it. And that was good. I, I can't repeat that. So you're going to have to rewind the video, but that was good to me. I'm actually had to listen back to that one because that is good. But we just want to encourage you today that God has a plan for your life and he's not done with you yet. No matter where you are, what state you're in, what, what mistakes you've made, God has a plan for your life. And he just wants you to come to him and talk to him about what it is that's on your heart. Tell him how you feel. Tell him about your fears, your concerns. Do that. But the fact that you're talking to God, which is prayer, is an act of faith, not faithlessness. It's an act of faith. And stay close to him, even in the midst of your, your, your challenges. Don't let it be confusion. Because God is not the author of confusion, right? So don't let it be confusion because when God gives you his word, he gives you his will. So if you're studying his word, you can stand on at least that much until God gives you an audible word or confirms by the Holy Spirit inside of you what it is you're supposed to do next. You know, that's what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to wait. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage, right? Amen. So, right here. And if uh, you guys have any comments or questions, uh, unmute yourself and feel free to share. So, Stephen, I wanted to... You know, I feel like in this moment, it's almost speaking as well to those who may, your poor choice may be your spouse, mm. but you're married now, right? Mm. And I'm reminded of when I married my ex-husband um, and I knew I should not marry him, but I did. Mm. Oh, goodness. Um, it, and it you know, everybody said I shouldn't marry him, so I can't even blame that. But it was in my, in my weakness and being beat down, having twins with no father. I married him, and 
you know, he would, he would, he was, you know, and, St and Stephen will take take uh, issue with this, but you know, <laughs> he was a minister, a pastor. He um, had an anointing on his life, but you know, the 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 sins and the bad things that happen when you're young and from your parents fell upon you. And, and if you don't fight out of that, you may be blessed by God, but you end up ruining everything that he gives you. Mm. And so, yeah, just hold it tight, Steve. You're doing real good. Um, Look, I got tears coming out because I'm holding in so much. <laughs> hold it in, Steve. <laughs> and so, you know, the message is that, you know, I remember going to, we had premarital counseling and, and asking God to bless our union. I remember being married and after, you know, the you know second, third year, just struggling so much and saying, God, I know I shouldn't have married him, but can you please, you know, take care of my children, help us, bless us. Um, and I spoke to a pastor um, and was having counseling. And he said, well, even the bad thing that you have done, if you've repented and turned to God, God can bless. So it's not as if you, you, you did something bad and nothing ever can come good again, because that's not true. That's not how our father is because you've repented. It's, he's a merciful God. And we, we look upon this story of the Egyptian woman. She was still found favor. Ishmael, who was supposed to be just a horrid person because of something his father said, now blessings are upon his life. And even though he had many nations that came, you know, 12 kings and all of this, it's still something that's going on in our world today, you know, um, with Islam. And so I think of the fact that there are many of us who have been married, divorced, have children, um, even choosing the wrong jobs and some things feel like they don't go right. We still have hope. You know, if God gave the slave woman hope, then he gives us hope. I mean, we're his children. So he does give us hope if he will give those that don't even believe in him hope. So um, th that's kind of what I feel stirring up on the inside of the, that we are not in purgatory forever. We should turn to God and, you know, follow his feet and admit our wrongs and ask him to, to be with us. So you know, if anybody's listening and feel like, you know, I've, I've messed up too much. I've killed a person. I've gone to jail. I've, I've messed up too much. I don't believe you've messed up too much with God because, see, we humans measure sin. God does not measure sin. Sin is sin, right? So whether you beat somebody up, killed someone, if you ask God for forgiveness and you believe in him, he'll forgive you. It's not a different level of forgiveness. That's something humans do. So Think on those things that are, are godly and the things that give you hope and, and, and read the scripture that, that talks about God and his, his forgiveness and, and what it takes to stay in him because that's what we're gonna need because all of us have fallen short of the glory, not, not just you, all of us have fallen short of the glory. That's right. There's only two types of people on the planet. There's sinners and forgiven sinners, but we're all sinners. That's the reality. Amen. Um, and when you said that, when you started out talking about someone that marries the wrong person, um, and thanks for being so transparent and sharing sharing that, um, a scripture came to mind, and this was someone who who is Christian who marries someone who's not a Christian. Uh, so you can have a scriptural reference um, because you're not supposed to be unequally yoked, right? So you're not supposed to, a believer is not supposed to marry an unbeliever or a person who is a who, who serves another, uh, is in another religion. Right. So if you're a Christian, you're not supposed to do that because uh, there's there's a consequence. There's always consequence for sin. You know, the wages of sin is death. And you would definitely feel that that pain in your marriage, even through your children. It's going that's going to be horrible. But anyway, here, here's the scripture that came to mind. First Corinthians 7, 14 for the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Else were your children unclean, but now are they holy? Uh, and so basically it's, it's, it's talking about how if you're a Christian and you marry someone who's who's not a Christian, um, they are sanctified by you because of your covenant with God. And so there's some protection there and there's some protection there for for your children as well. So there's like Sadie said, there's hope that God still can make 
you know, uh, give you a message out of the mess you created by doing that. All right. So uh, anything, anything else on today's lesson that you guys want to um, share any takeaways from today? Um, hi. Um, I just want to say a couple of things um, from what we read. God's promise to Abraham, Abraham was absolute. Man's, his plan, or, you know, with Sarah and Hagar was probable. And that's the biggest difference. When God gives us his promise, we have to know that it will, it's something that God stands by. He stands by his word. But when we, when we sort of um, get distracted, just as Abraham and Sarah were, Abraham, they, they, they considered their promise, they looked at themselves, and then they tried to play out God's plan, God's promise, based on their own human limitations. And that's why they deferred to the slave. But if they had kept hold of that promise, with that assurance that this is God's word to us and his word is absolute, that you cannot replace an absolute word with a probable word. And that's why we are sometimes impatient because think about it, 75 years the way he was given the promise, he actually materialized at age 100, 25 year gap where they were trying to finagle it and work things out based on their human limitations. So if we have a promise of God, or if we know that there's a promise of God hanging over our heads, let's hold on to that. That becomes our bull's eye. And let's stop trying to place pieces, loose fitting pieces into position to arrive at that promise. Let's leave it to God. And, and like Pastor Steve and, and our sister Sadia said, don't try to do it by your own selves because it will fail. You will be miserable and <laughs> you're gonna be constantly asking God for clemency, for, for mercy when you should be praising God for the fulfillment of his promises. Mm, that's good. Thank you so much. And we can see that being played out right now on our planet between um, Israel and all the Muslim nations around them, uh, because they all um, have a rightful claim to Abraham as their father, uh, because they did. They're all descendants from Abraham. Um, but the land that they're fighting over was land promised not to the the uh, to Ishmael, but to Isaac. And but they still are all saying, well, we're our father's Abraham, and so we have a right to it. And they're fighting. And we already saw the angel of the Lord told her, he Ishmael will fight against his kinsmen. He will be against his kinsmen. And it's been happening ever since uh, the beginning, ever since the beginning. And so there's a consequence for sin, um, you know, to Sadia's point that even though you make a wrong decision, you still got to suffer some pain. You're going to go through some stuff. God can uh, redeem, right? God can restore. Um, but still, our bad decisions have bad consequences. And God's not going to, this is another thing. People think that when God forgives, there's no consequence. No, there's a consequence. I mean, David, the story of David, and we'll, we'll get to this because he's he's in the in, in the line of men that we're going to be looking at. Um, but because of some things David did, he caused blood to be in his household, and it, it just destroyed his, his descendants because of that. Um, and David was God's chosen. But because of his actions, he caused this reap those repercussions of sin that happened in his family. And it was unstoppable, even though God loves them and all this, none of that has ever changed. There's a consequence for sin. Uh, so you can't be forgiven, um, but still there's there's pain that comes out of that because the wages of sin is death, all right? So it, it's just a, the way it's designed. All right, so does anybody have? Mm -hmm. Can I also share? Um, so when I was pregnant with the twins, I still went to church, guys. My family had always sat on the second row in the front because you know I hate distractions. I still, in my shame, went to church, set up front, and the very people who were my female friends um, looked at me as if I was worse than them, a sinner worse than them. And, you know, it, it, it hurt me so bad. And I told one lady when she happened to go to the bathroom at the same time I did, um, and I said, when she said something, I said, your, your sin isn't showing. My sin is showing. It's not that you're better than me. My sin is the, the consequence of my sin. I am pregnant. What's the consequence of your sin? 
you know, and that is true today for everyone. So just be, just because your sin may be showing, you may be in jail, something of that nature, we still all have sin. We, none of us are pious. Mm, that's good. Nope. I sin, you sin, everybody sin. It's a fact, period, you know, period. So <laughs> there's nobody perfect on the planet. Uh, and the only one that was perfect, they crucified him. So we know that's that's the truth. All right. Does anybody have anything else before we move on to our daily inspiration? Any uh, anything else that stood out from the day study or any questions? All right. So let's go ahead and move on to uh, Sister Evelyn. Evelyn, uh, if you could uh, come on camera and uh, all right, you already muted yourself. Good. All right. So we are going to go ahead and, and uh, transfer over to Evelyn Booker, our church mother for our daily inspiration. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, today is March 7th and it's right in line with what uh, Pastor Stephen just taught us, but it says, let me help you through this day. The challenges you face are far too great for you to handle alone. You are keenly aware of your helplessness in the scheme of events you face. This awareness opens up a choice to doggedly go it alone or walk with me in humble steps of dependence. Actually, this choice is continually before you, but difficulties highlight the decision-making process. So consider it all joy whenever you are enveloped in various trials. These are gifts from me, reminding you to rely on me alone. Mm. And that's from Psalm 63, seven to eight. Wow, that's a confirmation of what we've been studying. Yeah. Yeah, that's a confirmation of what we've been studying. I mean, we've been looking at the purpose of trials and tribulation and, you know, and, and actually I had somebody ask me a question. I think this was at church on Sunday. They said, does, does God cause these things to happen in our life? And I said, no, God allows these things to happen in our life so that we will be dependent on him and stay in his presence. And Jesus actually already told us that in this in this world, you will have tribulation. Now, Evelyn, in your life, when has this what you just read? When has that been the case in your life? Um, throughout life, but I wanted to share a real quick testimony. Um, mm -hmm. Stephen taught a few weeks ago. I have the date at the top on 221, eight ways trials help us. And then I got an email from the intercessory prayer ministry at my church asking me if I would do a virtual training on April 30th. And guess what my subject is? Praying in difficult situations. Mm. So the eight things that you gave us with back uh, scriptures to back every point I can use as my framework. Mm. Praise God. God is definitely in the midst of, of um, everything that's happening on a rise. Praise God. That, that's such a blessing. And again, that's a reminder to you guys that God is preparing us, each one of us. And even you watching the video, As a matter of fact, especially you watching the video, um, because we are we need to get in position to be used by God. And so we're learning not so that we can learn on our own. One thing I shared with my children when they were like in middle school was that you don't go to school to learn. You go to school to learn to teach. It's a whole different type of learning when you're trying to learn to teach someone else. And so when you're studying God's word, that's how we're studying it. It's not for us to consume for ourselves. It's for us to get and then give out. So when you're studying, be prepared because what you're studying and getting, God's going to put you in a position where you got to give it out. And that's what's happening with Evelyn. It's a clear um, evidence of that, that God is putting us in position now to be his hands and his feet and his mouthpiece in the earth and multiplying himself through us to the world. And as the world starts growing darker, which has been doing the last, you know, well, been doing for a while, but really the last two years, God needs his light to shine through us to a hurting and dying world. And uh, and so anyway, God will use you. Um, like someone said to me that God doesn't care about your ability. God cares about your availability. So just be ready to be used when he calls, go. That's what it's all about. So, all right, Evelyn, do you have anything else before we, we close down? Nope, we're good. All right, y'all can just look at Evelyn, just see how blessed she is. I mean, just the blessings of the Lord has been on her. You know, I think you one of God's special children, Evelyn. I mean, we're all special, but you you just, ever since I met you, got, you know what? It's probably because you have probably have, your family seems to me to be a family that's always been close to the Lord. Is that true? Yes. Yeah, it's yeah. like you, 
like you are an inheritor of the continued blessing throughout your family, your line. So um, God be the glory. Yeah. Praise the Lord. And I can see that happening with your children and your children's children. It's yes. still passing for it's beautiful. That's what we want in our family line too. like all the generational curses are broken. Amen. We are now just a whole new person for it. And it's not just your physical children. Sometimes the spiritual children, God, God brings people in your life. I'm about to go into a whole different teaching, but anyway, sometimes God brings people in your life to mentor, to love and to treat as your children. Um, and they, they, they operate just like that. They call, they check back in on you. They're just like children. Uh, mm -hmm. so it's the same thing. So if you don't have physical children and you have people you mentor, you care for, and you love, it's the same, same concept. So praise God for that. All right. So let's go ahead and, and, uh, and end with prayer. Evelyn, can you close us in prayer? Oh my, yes. <laughs> Our Father in heaven, we come to you as humbly as we know how, thanking you for this wonderful day, this wonderful Monday that you are, have allowed us to experience. Yeah. It's only beginning, but we began the day by giving thanks, acknowledging mm -hmm. you, and then coming on the Arise Bible study. Now, Lord, uh, pour back into Pastor Stephen what he's poured out to us and let us be blessed today, individually and collectively. And let everything that we say and do be to your glory and to your honor. It's in the mighty, marvelous, matchless name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Yes. Amen. All right. Everybody that's on the call, stay here for a second. I'm going to end this video, but I have a testimony to share with you guys on the other side. So just hold your